My name is Marco Pazzi from the Center for the History of Hermetic Philosophy and Related Currents, and I'm here at the Biblioteca Philosophica Hermetica in Amsterdam to have my first webinar, which is going to be devoted today to Gustav Meyrink. Gustav Meyrink is one of the most interesting uh, writers inspired by esotericism. Uh, you have uh, other examples like Edward Buller Lytton, who tried perhaps to distill esoteric truths and uh, ideas into their literary creations. So today I am going to focus on Meyrink. There is a very important collection of papers and documents related to Meyrink here at the library. Uh, and in fact, this was the basis for a very important exhibition that took place in 2009 here at the library and for which also uh, a very important book was published, the catalogue uh, was published, uh, which I will also show you later. But before uh, getting into uh, Maring's biography and works, I would like to tell you something about uh, how I encountered uh, Maring, what was my uh, first uh, encounter with him. I discovered Maring when I was uh, around 19, and the first novel I read by him was this. This is the Italian edition of one of his novels, uh, which in German is titled Walpurgisnacht, and in Italian it is titled La Notte di Walpurga, uh, or Purgis Night in English. Now, as you can see, this is a very cheap edition. Actually, it's a paperback edition with uh, a horror cover actually it says it's a book of the horror uh, referring to the content of the book but i think the the very uh, uh the, the 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 only horror that is here is actually on the cover um so i was intrigued by the book uh, um, and by the author for several reasons i had heard uh, myring being mentioned uh, here and there uh, and also um when I saw the book in a bookshop, uh, I started leafing through the pages and I was captured a little bit by the content. Uh, uh, it seemed to me that there was a, there was a strange fascination in uh, in in the words in uh, what I was what I was reading. Um, and also another important reason was that I was at this moment preparing for my first trip to uh, Czechoslovakia, actually to Prague. I wanted to visit what is perhaps the most uh, esoteric city in the world. Uh, and so I wanted to nourish myself also with some uh, uh, esoteric or literary uh, inspiration before, before I left. So I read this novel and I also read uh, another book that was uh, extremely important for me at the time. And this was a book by an Italian uh, author who was a professor of Russian and Czech literature at the University of La Sapienza in, uh, in Rome. And his name was Angelo Maria Ripellino. And in 1973, he published this book. Here we have uh, the German edition from uh, the collection of the library. Of course, at the time I read the Italian edition. The title was Praga Magica. The German edition is titled Magisches Prague. Uh, and this was a wonderful book because um, it was an exploration of uh, how Prague had been uh, a source of inspiration for so many poets, uh, artists, uh, uh, literary men uh, throughout the centuries. Uh, so starting from the age of Rudolf II and uh, the late 16th century and up to our days basically. Uh, what was fascinating about the book was that uh, it really gave um, a vivid impression of how the city had been the center of uh, uh, the encounter of different cultures. So it was a kind of melting pot, uh, in a way. Uh, and there were three communities that were particularly important there. There were others, but the three most important ones were uh, the Czech community, of course, the German community and also very important the Jewish community. So the three communities had coexisted and lived together uh, for many centuries. Uh, Meyerink in a way uh, is an expression also of this encounter because um, I think he was very much influenced by, uh, by the place and also 
by uh, the Czech environment, so to speak. But for instance, the Jewish element uh, features prominently in his novels. Uh, so in what is probably the most famous one by him, the Golem, but also in the other ones. Um, so after reading the book, of course, uh, the book by Ripellino is full of references to, uh, to Meyrink uh, and actually to many other authors who were inspired by uh, esoteric ideas, esoteric themes. And after reading the two books, uh, I had my travel to, to Prague. Um, reading Walpurgisnacht uh, was a very strange experience because um, well, I had been interested in esotericism for a while already, uh, but, uh, well, the style was uh, a bit complex, so it was not really easy to follow, uh, to follow the plot, to follow the story. And as I later found out, this is absolutely typical of uh, actually all of uh, Meiring's novels, uh, which usually have very intricate plots. And also they take place uh, in uh, different temporal levels, different historical periods at the same time. Uh, people who have multiple personalities at the same time. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to understand what is going on really. Um, some of the ideas were slightly familiar to me. Um, uh, also because, as I said, I had been interested in esotericism for a while. Some others, well, were still a bit uh, more mysterious to me. After reading the novel and Ripollino's book, uh, I went to Prague. And obviously enough, I tried to look for the places that were mentioned in the novel and try to see uh, if they still existed. Now, uh, it should be considered that uh, at that time it was 1987, so it was even before the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall, uh, Prague and uh, Czechoslovakia. Czech Czechoslovakia was still uh, a single country where uh, a communist place. Uh, so, well, in a way I thought it would be a hopeless uh, search, but in fact I was surprised because uh, there is, for instance, uh, a restaurant that is mentioned in the novel, uh, which is called Zum Schnell. Uh, it's actually a kind of fast food place as it could exist uh, in those times, in the early 20th century. Uh, the name says it all. Uh, and, uh, well, more or less the novel says where it was supposed to be. Uh, so it was at the foot of Malastrana, which is uh, uh, the area at the foot of the castle. Um, and, uh, well, there was in fact a restaurant that was called Ushnellu which was a kind of uh, Czech version of uh, the German name, Zum Schnell. And so I had uh, a very nice uh, dish of ragu with uh, Czech gnocchi there, thinking that I might be one of the characters of uh, Baring's novel. Um, now, one interesting question is why Meiring was so uh, accessible uh, in Italy at the time. Uh, because the fortune of Meyrink is a bit strange. He was extremely successful uh, when he published his uh, novels. In fact, The Golem that was published in 1915 was a huge bestseller. It sold thousands and thousands of copies and it was translated into uh, many different languages. So it was uh, an instant bestseller, really. And also the novels that he published uh, after that one was, were particularly successful, also due to the success, actually, of, uh, of the first one. But then, after his death, uh, the fortune of Meiring declined a little bit, and, uh, well, he was not so, pop uh, so popular so, uh, after the Second World War. Um, but, interestingly enough, in Italy, uh, most of these things were not only translated uh, in its heydays, but also kept in print, uh, even uh, later on. And I think this has to do with uh, a very interesting aspect uh, of his fortune in Italy. And this is the fact that one of the authors uh, who were influenced by him and who were very interested uh, in him was a very famous Italian esotericist called uh, Julius Evola. Now, Julius Evola uh, not only was uh, interested in him, he wrote uh, also essays about uh, Meiring. Uh, sometimes he translated works uh, by Meiring, uh, and uh, um, in fact we have here 
an Italian edition of a book by Palmyring, uh, Il Libro della Tila, uh, and uh, this was uh, originally published in 1923, and the translation was actually made by Julius Evola. And uh, because Julius Evola uh, was such an influential figure in esoteric uh, milieus in Italy, I think this explains uh, why Myring continued to have uh, such a fortune also uh, after, well, his popularity declined in other countries. And uh, the interesting thing is that sometimes uh, very nice editions of his works uh, were done. Uh, here we have a very nice example. Uh, this is uh, a collection of short stories, Il Cardinale Napellus, uh, uh, that was published in a series edited by Jorge Luis Borges, that was published by Franco Maria Ricci. Franco Maria Ricci is probably one of the most famous uh, art publishers uh, in Italy, with uh, very nice uh, editions. And here we have a very nice uh, edition also of La Faccia Verde, uh, Das Grüne Gesicht, one of the novels by Meiring, uh, and this is actually the first Italian edition, this is part of uh, the collection uh, here at the library. And I just wanted to show you also, this is uh, the first edition of Walpurgis Night, uh, Walpurgis Nacht, uh, in German of course, and the first edition is from 1917. Uh, Today Meiring uh, in Italy is still published by major publishers uh, and in fact we have Adelphi that uh, has in his catalogue uh, Das Grüne Gesicht, uh, Il Volto Verde, which is the novel that has uh, a strong connection to Amsterdam uh, of course. Adelphi is one of the most important uh, publishers in Italy. And uh, for the reasons that I mentioned before, also, quite a few uh, monographs and collections of essays were published. Uh, so here is Meiring Scrittore Iniziato, Meiring Writer and Initiate. Uh, so this is a collective volume of essays that was published in 1983 by Manilo Basai. And this is also present here in the collection uh, of the library. Now, I would like to talk a bit more generally about uh, Gustav Meiring, his life uh, and his works. First of all, I would like to uh, mention a few of the important publications that have come out uh, in recent years about uh, Meiring and that uh, have given a kind of deeper image uh, of his life and works. So the first book that I would like to mention is a book by Hartmut Binder. It's a thick and very heavy book. The title is Gustav Meiring, Ein Leben im Bann der Magie. So uh, the title already uh, shows that uh, the uh, esoteric element, the magic element, is an element that is important to understand uh, the biography of Meiring and his interests and his works also. The other important publication is a biography, uh, this time in English, by Mike Mitchell. The title is Vivo, the life of Gustav Meiring. And finally, we have uh, a book that was published uh, on the occasion of the important exhibition that was held uh, here at the Biblioteca Philosophica Hermetica. This was in 2009, and the title of the book is Der magische Schriftsteller Gustav Meiring, seine Freunde, seine Freunde und sein Werk. So, the magic writer Gustav Meiring, uh, his friends and his work by Theodor Harmsen, uh, who uh, is a curator at the Biblioteca Philosophica Hermetica. Uh, so, uh, in the book here, uh, you find uh, a lot of uh, beautiful images, uh, also of many documents and papers that are here in the collection uh, of the library. So, uh, I would like to say something about uh, the life trajectory of Gustav Meiring. Um, Gustav Meiring was born in uh, 1868, which is uh, precisely a hundred years uh, before me, and I think this was uh, also a reason for feeling particularly connected to him when I uh, noticed uh, the date of his birth. Uh, he was born in Vienna, and he was uh, the illegitimate child of an aristocrat. Uh, it was the Baron uh, von Van Buller und zu Hemmingen and an actress, uh, Maria Meyer. Uh, this is an interesting biographical detail 
uh, because uh, the father, for obvious reasons, was not uh, present so much in the, the early life of Gustav Meiring. Uh, although apparently he contributed financially also to the upbringing, upbringing and the education of, uh, of young Meiring. Um, but of course it was a kind of missing uh, figure in the life uh, of, uh, of Meiring. And I think there is perhaps an interesting analogy there with other figures uh, in the history of esotericism or other figures, uh, literary figures, who were also interested in esotericism. And I think uh, a couple of examples would be uh, Pascal Beverly Randolph, uh, for instance, who was also an illegitimate child uh, of uh, a white rich man and uh, a black woman in the United States, um, first half of the 19th century. Um, another interesting example, perhaps uh, slightly different, would be Alistair Crowley, who was not an illegitimate son, but uh, who lost his father at a very early age, so basically grew up without uh, this important figure. Uh, actually, his father died when he was um, around 10, 11. Uh, another interesting example, and in this case it's more a literary figure, who was also fascinated uh, by esotericism, is Fernando Pessoa, who lost his father when he was even younger, when he was uh, about five years old. So there is something interesting there, because um, perhaps it would be too much to link up automatically uh, such a biographical detail with uh, a passion or an interest in esotericism. But it's true that perhaps the fact of being in a, an illegitimate child uh, uh, could lead you to see yourself as a kind of outsider uh, or having the feeling of not really finding your place, uh, uh, having a problem in uh, uh, defining yourself in terms of uh, social class, for instance, or in terms of community. So perhaps uh, the fact that this is a detail that we find in uh, different authors uh, should make us think that perhaps there is some kind of connection. Now, uh, Myrink had a uh, very good education, so he grew, grew up basically uh, with his mother, uh, first in Vienna, then in other uh, German-speaking cities uh, in Germany, so in uh, Munich first, uh, then in Hamburg. And then in uh, 1883, uh, the mother moved to Prague, and of course Jan uh, Meiring uh, went with her. Meiring, by the way, is just a literary pseudonym that he assumed when he started publishing his literary works, because he just uh, at the beginning he just took up uh, the name of the mother, Meyer, uh, because uh, being an illegitimate son, he could not take uh, the name of his father. Uh, after moving to Prague, uh, Meiring basically spent the next 20 years of his life there. Uh, his literary talent, uh, his literary vocation did not manifest itself immediately. And interestingly enough, at the beginning he uh, went for a business career. Actually, he uh, created um, a bank, a banking enterprise, together uh, with a friend and an, an associate. Um, so he established this bank called uh, Meyer and Morgenstern. And at the beginning, he was quite uh, successful as a businessman. Uh, even if he went through some uh, personal crisis, uh, I think the most uh, important of these crises was a personal crisis he had in 1892, uh, where for a number of reasons he found himself uh, on the verge of suicide. And here we have one of these classical anecdotes uh, which punctuate uh, Meiring's biography. So the story goes, which he himself uh, tells by the way, the story goes that um, he was alone in his uh, apartment, ready to shoot himself, uh, and one second before he was pulling the trigger, he saw that a booklet was being pushed under the door of the apartment. Uh, well, he became curious and uh, went to see what it was, and it was a book about spiritualism and the afterlife. And of course the coincidence was quite striking, because for someone who was just trying to uh, kill himself, to, to commit suicide, 
it was quite uh, intriguing to have uh, yeah, a book being, uh, so to speak, sent to you right at that moment talking about what would happen uh, after you die in the afterlife. Now, um, this apparently, or so is the reconstruction that Myrick makes of the episode, uh, this would be the starting point of Myrick's interest in uh, esoteric subjects. From that, from that moment on, he uh, started reading everything that was related to spiritualism, to psychic abilities, uh, esoteric, the occult, uh, and so on. And in fact, he became uh, acquainted with uh, a number of important figures. He was uh, very much involved in the uh, esoteric milieus in Prague at the time. He joined the Theosophical Society, although not for uh, a very long time and was also in contact with a number of very important figures in the uh, occult milieu, in the occult uh, world of the time, also internationally. Uh, among them, well, perhaps uh, it is good to mention uh, William Wynne Westcott, who was one of the founders of the Golden Dawn. Some authors even claim that, in fact, uh, Myron became a member of the Golden Dawn, but this is a bit disputed. He was also in contact with a very important figure of uh, the world of uh, esoteric fringe masonry at the time, uh, John Yarker. <clears throat> so we, we do have uh, correspondence and letters that these, uh, that these important figures exchanged uh, with each other. Um, at the same time, Myring was also creating, participating in other esoteric groups, so he was very active. And it is fair to say that um, he liked to explore, he liked to experiment, and in this sense perhaps he was not too dissimilar uh, from the other very important literary figure I mentioned before, the other uh, important uh, esoteric uh, novelist um, uh, of the 19th, uh, 20th century, so of the last two centuries, uh, that is Edward Buller Lytton. So he liked to experiment with different things. Um, he was also interested in uh, oriental traditions, oriental ideas, uh, an interest that uh, transpires also in some of the novels. But to continue with, uh, with the biography, um, things began to uh, uh, go wrong at one point uh, in uh, Myring's business career. And uh, in 1902, he even had serious problems because, in fact, he was uh, even put to jail for two months, uh, being accused of uh, fraud. And this is when, basically, he had to give up uh, with his uh, career in the business world. He had, uh, basically, well, his banking enterprise went bankrupt, and he even had to leave uh, Prague. This is the moment, then, when... Uh, the life of uh, Gustav Meyring takes a sudden turn because clearly uh, his uh, business career is over uh, and uh, not only he has to change uh, life but he also has to change place because this is the moment when he leaves Prague and goes uh, to live somewhere else, uh, actually in Germany. It's in, it is interesting to, uh, to note that in fact um, most of his literary works will be produced after he has left Prague, and yet Prague will feature so prominently uh, in his novels, in his works. So it's interesting to see how the kind of Prague that we see in the novels is a Prague of the memory, of the impressions, uh, of the feelings, the emotions that he had when he was there, but he was not there while he was writing uh, the novels. So, because basically uh, the, the city and, uh, and, uh, and the region, the country, had become uh, burned territory for him, so he had to leave, and he went to live uh, first uh, in Vienna, then in Munich, uh, he was in different places, and then eventually he ended up uh, in a place uh, in Bavaria called uh, Lake Starnberg, uh, which he elected uh, to his... Uh, main domicile, basically he spent most of the rest of his life uh, there up until his death in 1932. Uh, now this is also when he uh, begins to consider himself seriously as, uh, as a writer and he really starts uh, writing consistently and also trying to publish 
what uh, what he is writing. Um, he does not um, uh, become known uh, immediately as an esoteric author. In fact, the first things that he uh, that he's publishing uh, around the same time when he uh, uh, moves away from Prague, uh, slightly earlier, around that time, that period, are actually sort of satires, are uh, sort of uh, ironic, uh, paradoxal short stories that focus very much on uh, uh, on uh, the bourgeoisie, the middle class that he uh, liked to fustigate as being particularly hypocritical. So this is something that you find um, uh, again and again in uh, in the uh, Habsburgic literature, let's say the, the uh, literature of the Austrian Empire uh, at the time. So it's a kind of literature that is a bit disenchanted. Um, there is a kind of feeling in the air that the Empire is going to collapse soon. Uh, perhaps uh, it has come uh, at the end of its days. And this, of course, is going to happen soon enough because uh, the First World War is just around the corner. And uh, you can see in reading some of these authors that uh, the feeling was very much in the air already. And there was a feeling uh, as uh, uh, if a kind of world was coming to an end. Um, but the breakthrough of Gustav Meyring as an author comes uh, uh, with the publication of uh, his most famous novel, which was The Golem. Um, here the chronology is interesting and important because the novel was written uh, in the uh, early part of 1914. Uh, that means before the outbreak of the First World War. But it was published actually during the war, because it was published one year later, in 1915. And uh, Mayer, not being already an established uh, author, he was known in certain uh, literary milieus, uh, literary circles, uh, uh, especially the circles around um, a satirical journal called the Simplicissimus. Uh, still, he had trouble in uh, finding a contract uh, for, for his book. Eventually he managed to, to, to publish it in 1915 and it was, as I said, an immediate success. Uh, it became a huge bestseller. And the library, as I said before, has um, a very nice first edition. Actually, in, in fact, there are multiple copies of, uh, of the first edition. And in a minute we are going to see uh, some of the lithographs because uh, the, the edition was embellished by uh, really beautiful lithographs that illustrate uh, some of the episodes of, uh, of the novel. Mountain uh, on top of uh, uh, the, the link side of the city of Prague. So here is again the face of the golem that we have seen already. And here is the golem that is roaming uh, in the Jewish cemetery, uh, which is very famous in Prague. It's uh, where the ghetto used to be. Nowadays, uh, the ghetto doesn't, does not exist anymore. Uh, but the cemetery has survived, so it's still possible to visit it. And it's uh, like a, a forest of stones, of tumble stones. And uh, there is a scene where the golem is going around. Uh, and this is a scene of the ghetto. You can see the style is really uh, very close to uh, the expressionist style of the time, uh, of Germany in those times. And you have these kind of tall houses uh, with very narrow streets. And uh, all of this has disappeared. And in fact, even when Meyrink uh, wrote his novel, it had already disappeared for quite some time because uh, the ghetto was destroyed uh, around the 1880s. Uh, mainly for sanitary purposes. So when uh, the Jewish community was still very much present in, um, in Prague, so uh, much before any kind of anti-Semitic persecution, it was more for health uh, and sanitary reasons that the ghetto uh, was destroyed. And in, <clears throat> uh, in place of uh, the ghetto, uh, new houses were built with much larger uh, streets. Here, another scene with the golem uh, going around in uh, the streets of the ghetto. And it's interesting that uh, a film was made uh, based on the novel. 
uh, and this was uh, uh, made in 1920 by Paul Wegener and it has become uh, a masterpiece of uh, German expressionist uh, film and it has survived so it's still possible uh, to see it uh, it's interesting that the image of the golem that you see in the film is very different from the one uh, you see here in the lithographs here the golem uh, has a kind of bald head whereas in the film uh, it's it's kind of uh, uh, hair combed uh, more like uh, uh, Betty May. So and here we have um, a synagogue, a synagogue of the ghetto. So you can see here uh, the seal of Solomon on top of it. And here is another scene in the novel where you have uh, the golem bringing a book uh, to the main character of the novel. Uh, of Germany in those times and you have these kind of tall houses uh, with very narrow streets and uh, all of this has disappeared and in fact even when Meyrink uh, wrote his novel it had already disappeared for quite some time because uh, the ghetto was destroyed uh, around the 1880s uh, mainly for sanitary purposes so when uh, the Jewish community was still very much present in um, in Prague, so uh, much before any kind of anti-Semitic persecution. It was more for health uh, and sanitary reasons that the ghetto uh, was destroyed. And in, <clears throat> uh, in place of uh, the ghetto, uh, new houses were built with much larger uh, streets. Here, another scene with the golem uh, going around in uh, the streets of the ghetto. And it's interesting that uh, a film was made uh, based on the novel uh, and this was uh, uh, made in 1920 by Paul Wegener and it has become uh, a masterpiece of uh, German expressionist uh, film and it has survived so it's still possible uh, to see it. Uh, it's interesting that the image of the golem that you see in the film is very different from the one uh, you see here in the lithographs. Here the golem uh, has a kind of bald head, whereas in the film uh, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, hair combed uh, more like uh, uh, Betty May. So, and here we have um, a synagogue, a synagogue of the ghetto. So you can see here uh, the seal of Solomon on top of it. And here is another scene in the novel where you have uh, the golem bringing a book uh, to the main character of the novel. The other two novels were published uh, during the war uh, and I think it shows uh, both in the Green Face, Das Grüne Gesicht and also in Walpurgis Night, uh, Walpurgis Nacht. Uh, it's, it's very clear that uh, something of the atmosphere uh, of the war is uh, pouring into the novels. There is this feeling of impending destruction, um, like a catastrophe, as I said, something like an apocalypse that is going to rush over us and uh, uh, turn the whole world upside down. So I think this is uh, a feeling that was shared by uh, quite a few authors at the time, uh, but I think it also had a special taste for authors who were born and raised in the Austrian Empire, so who belong to that particular generation as, um, as the one of uh, Gustav Meyrink. Uh, because in their case it was not just uh, the end uh, uh, of uh, perhaps a particular uh, social system, uh, of a particular set of values, um, of a particular traditional way of uh, looking at things, at society and so on, it was also the end of uh, the empire, so the end of a history of, uh, of centuries. Um, and um, after the Second World War, uh, Meiring published uh, another novel, uh, The White Dominican, uh, Der Weiße Dominikaner, which is interesting because there you can see interesting references to Taoism and to some uh, Eastern uh, traditions. And um, here we have uh, the manuscript of, uh, of the novel. So it is part of the collection of, uh, of the library. And uh, well, uh, you can see here that uh, uh, 
So in here you can see a few pages of the manuscript. Uh, uh, this was probably already a fair copy, uh, not the, uh, the very first version. But uh, you, as you can see there are still a few uh, corrections here and there. And this is a wonderful uh, item from the collection here of the library. After uh, the white Dominican uh, Gustav Meiring wrote uh, another novel, in the meanwhile he kept on writing short stories also, sometimes even uh, essays uh, that include uh, autobiographical details uh, also about his experiences with uh, the paranormal, with the occult. So uh, they offer us sometimes very interesting glimpses into the way in which he understood and experienced uh, uh, esotericism and the occult. But uh, the next uh, important literary project he had uh, after the White Dominican was uh, The Angel from the West Window, uh, Der Engel vom Westlichen Fenster, uh, which is a novel that he never published actually because he died before he uh, really uh, could publish it. Uh, so this was written around uh, 1927. Um, there is a tragic detail uh, in the late years of Myring's life because he um, lost his uh, son uh, who had um, a, a terrible ski accident um, so while he was skiing he had uh, a fall and he injured uh, his back spine uh, very seriously and uh, so he could not really be cured so basically uh, he was diagnosed uh, with a bad injury and uh, probably he could never walk again. So the son uh, committed suicide uh, because of that. Um, instead of living a miserable life uh, where he could not walk and basically be independent anymore, he committed suicide. He was um, only 22 or 23. And this was, of course, a devastating blow for Myring, uh, who died or perhaps let himself die uh, only one year later. And there again we have another interesting anecdote, uh, but uh, it's not clear how much uh, these anecdotes were uh, really true and how much they were part of uh, uh, the intention of fictionalize also his own life. So uh, the story goes that he basically sat uh, in front of uh, an open window with the rising sun and he just uh, waited for death to come there uh, looking at the sun in front uh, in front of him so the the novel uh, the angel from uh, uh, the west window was published after after his death a few years after his death and here you have also the first edition that is uh, part also of uh, the collection here uh, at the library <coughs> One of the interesting details about uh, Myring is that he was not only uh, an author of short stories, of novellas, uh, of novels, uh, of essays, but he was also uh, an editor. And in fact, he was instrumental in publishing some very interesting books. In fact, he uh, edited a series, a book series, uh, with uh, a publisher specializing in the occult. Uh, the publisher was called uh, Ricola Ferlag, and uh, I have a couple of books here from uh, the collection of the library. Uh, so this is uh, a novel by Pascal Beverly Randolph uh, that was uh, still unpublished when it came out. So in fact, Myring translated uh, the novel himself, the manuscript, and published it in, in the German version. So this was published in 19. 22. Actually, Byring, before becoming a successful uh, author, uh, earned his living also as, as a translator. He translated an enormous amount of, uh, of literature, especially from English uh, into German. And another title from the same uh, series is a monograph on uh, Eliphas Levi, which was one of the earliest uh, biographies and monographs on Eliphas Levi that were published actually in any language. So the author was uh, R. H. Lars, and this was also published by Ricola Ferlag, of course, the same year, 1922. And the title is Eliphas Levi, Der Grosse Kabbalist und seine magischen Werke. Eliphas Levi, 
the great Kabbalist and uh, his magical uh, work. By the way, I forgot to mention the title of uh, the, the, the novel by Randolph. The title is Dula Bell, uh, and the subtitle is Ein Rosenkreuzer Roman, uh, a Rosicrucian novel. And in fact, if you read the biography of Pascal Beverly Randolph by uh, John Patrick Devini, he talks quite a bit about, uh, about this novel. And also, uh, about the way in which uh, Meiring was able to uh, get his hands on the manuscript. As I said before, Meiring was in contact with uh, uh, a lot of important uh, figures in the esoteric milieus uh, of his time uh, in Europe, but also outside of Europe. And uh, uh, in fact, it is probably through these channels that he was able to uh, receive the manuscript of this novel by Randolph. <clears throat> The last thing that I wanted to show you is uh, another very interesting um, item from uh, the collection. The collection is full of, uh, of papers, of letters, of documents. It's a gold mine for, uh, for the specialist, for the scholar of Myring. Uh, much of it has gone, of course, into the book by Theodore Harmson, which documents the exhibition that was held here in 2009. Uh, but still, there are so many interesting things, uh, so I wanted to show you this, uh, this postcard that was uh, produced uh, in 1928. Uh, and it's interesting because there is a kind of motto here in Latin uh, with uh, a picture of Gustav Meyerinck aside. The, lotto, the motto says, Summa scientia nihil scire, uh, the highest wisdom in not to know anything, is not to know anything. Uh, and here we have uh, a very interesting series of letters, uh, which is a nice example of the kind of documents that we have here uh, at the library. And these are letters to an unknown uh, correspondent of uh, Myring, and uh, in these letters he talks about uh, his interest uh, in Kabbalah, in spiritualism, some of his experiences. And here we have the last item that I would like to uh, show to you today. It's actually an exceptional object. Uh, this is uh, the death mask of uh, Gustav Meyerinck that was taken, uh, in fact, immediately after he died uh, on his deathbed. And so you can have an impression of his uh, aspect, his features, uh, when he died and in the last period of his life. Uh, also, perhaps you can see a bit of, uh, of the pain and the suffering that was caused by the loss of his son in uh, the last year of his life. And with this I would like to conclude uh, and I would like to thank you for being uh, with me today. So this was the first uh, episode of this new series of uh, webinars uh, in the Infinite Fire series with me. Uh, the next two episodes uh, will be uh, in the coming weeks, uh, will become available in the coming weeks. Uh, you will hear more about uh, the subject by uh, checking also the announcements of the websites uh, of the library. And uh, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for the staff members of the Center for the History of Hermetic Philosophy and Related Cards to collaborate with the library. Uh, and uh, I would like to invite you then to follow also the next webinars. Thank you very much.